This meeting for January 26th of the Senate Finance Committee will come to order. We have two bills on the agenda. We're going to start with Senate File 33. Welcome to the other side of the table, Senator Murphy. <laughs> Good morning, Mr. Chair and members. How are you? Warmer in here than outside. I will say that my, um, my grandmother, whose name was Euphemia, was a night person, and uh, I am too. <laughs> I am delighted to be with you today uh, to talk with you about Senate File 33, which is a finance bill uh, to restore and extend funding uh, for the purposes of criminal prosecution in the Attorney General's office. I am grateful that General Ellison is with us today, and he will be here if you have questions for him. But this is a fairly simple bill. Uh, by way of background, I am an alum of the Attorney General's office. I worked for Attorney General Humphrey many, many years ago as a legislative director. Uh, and I recall as a part of the executive committee of that group uh, the important work that that office did to support our 87 county attorneys when they had crimes occurring in their counties and they wanted the assistance of the Attorney General's office uh, to be able to prosecute those because the cases were sometimes extending beyond the capacity that they had. Attorney General Ellison is very clear when he says, our attorney generals and our county's attorney are excellent. They are. But in some cases, especially in greater Minnesota, in some of our more rural counties, our attorney generals or our county attorney offices may only have two or three lawyers practicing. And if they have a crime, a violent crime, that extends beyond their capacity, it is by law their ability to come to the attorney general's office and ask for help. When Attorney General Ellison was elected, the criminal division had one lawyer. He did some reorganization in that office to make sure that there were three lawyers in that criminal division. And for four years now, he has sought additional funding to amplify that office, to make sure that they have the resources to serve the statewide purpose of our county attorneys in their pursuit of justice. That's what this bill is for. It has moved through the House on a number of occasions, but we haven't seen it in the Senate. You will see on the fiscal note or on the bill itself that there is funding for this year uh, in 2023 and then ongoing funding of more than $4 million to hire up to seven more attorneys and I believe three paralegals to amplify that office to give it the resources they need to be able to do the work that they do with our county attorneys. And with that, I'm happy to answer your questions. Senator Pratt. Thank you. Mr. Chair, maybe before we, we dive into questions, Senator Murphy touched on a question that I had in my packet. I don't have a fiscal note on this bill. Do we have one? Mr. Um, Mr. Chair and Senator Pratt, it's a good question. By, by custom and practice, when uh, the Finance Committee has simply an appropriation bill in front of it, the appropriations are the cost of the bill. Thank you. So there isn't a lot of need for an individual fiscal note in this particular circumstance. There are some cases where there's some nuance um, but I think this is just simply an appropriation. I think the committee can discuss what the money is used for, uh, but in this case, I don't, in my judgment, the fiscal note isn't quite required. We right. saved a little paperwork here. Thank you. Appreciate that clarification. Thank you. Sir Dreheim, and then we'll go to testimony in a few minutes, but, or I don't know, maybe. We'll go ahead, Senator Dreheim. Okay. Senator Murphy, go ahead with um, is Attorney General Ellison wish to comment or anybody else? Or? General Ellison, would you like to join me? Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, good morning to you. Good morning to our vice chair uh, friends and to our ranking member and all members. Thank you very much. Uh, members, I, I, don't ha I do have prepared remarks I am uh, thinking that it's probably not the best use of our time for me to read six pages of comments to you. Uh, I think that the, the best thing to do is to just let you know is that this idea didn't start with me. Uh, it, it is a result of conversations with our county attorneys. The Minnesota County Attorneys Association has supported this request ever since we've made it four years ago. Uh, and uh, it's individual county attorneys <clears throat> continue to, to call us and 
Uh, when I, uh, as, as uh, Senator Murphy noted, uh, when, when, when Skip Humphrey was the, uh, was the Attorney General, we had 12. The, if, we, if, we are, uh, if you all award this uh, money to us, we'll be able to have 10 trial attorneys. Uh, and uh, I think we'll keep them, I'm not, I don't think so, I know we'll keep them all busy, but it'll allow us to do something more than just a homicide or a crim, criminal sexual conduct one. We've been in conversations with county attorneys about uh, sex trafficking, human trafficking, uh, financial exploitation, which spans multiple counties. Uh, right now, if there is a is one victim, one place, and the evidence is more or less localized, we can go in there and help on the most serious cases. But anything systemic uh, is difficult. Uh, and uh, I, it just bothers me to know that there's victimization going on, and yet our ability to really go after it uh, is somewhat limited. So with that, I'll, I'll rest and be happy to answer any questions uh, that any members have. Thank you. Question, Senator Drehan. Thank you, Chair, and, and thank you uh, both for, for coming and bringing this bill forward, which I, I do think uh, there is definitely a need out there for more help for our counties. Um, being new to this committee and not serving on any of the judiciary committees, uh, I'm not as familiar with your office as I am with other parts of state government. Um, so th these new hirees would be for criminal prosecution, um, can you just give me a broad overview of how many people work in the office and then kind of break down what the different divisions are so I kind of understand the scope? Thank you. Mr. Chair, Senator Draham, I'd be happy to do so, sir. Let me tell you, the uh, Office of the Attorney General's Office is a constitutional office. It's identified in the, U the Constitution for our state of Minnesota. Uh, the chapter that outlines the work of the Attorney General's office is primarily located in Chapter 8. So I'm going to mention Ch Minnesota Chapter 8 a few times. But we also have other laws that we, oper we have to enforce, such as the requirement that we help small businesses and individuals uh, with rates, uh, utility rates. So we represent in front of the Public Utilities Commission, residential utilities. We also uh, have requirements regarding charities, and also we have a requirement under Minnesota 8.31 to stop any sort of unfair, deceptive trade practices in business, commerce, or trade. That's uh, paraphrasing the statute. So we have several statutory obligations that we have to meet. Right now, uh, we, you know, we're always hiring someone or somebody's moving on. So we, th as of this morning, my staff tells me we have 340 staff members total. Of those, about 150 are lawyers. Uh, we have four basic divisions. Um, and then we have our non-lawyer complement. So of the lawyers, uh, so I'm the, uh, the attorney general. My chief deputy is a fellow by the name of John Keller. And he oversees uh, our, our, our solicitors group. What is that? That is a group that deals with appeals. The other group is the uh, government agencies. That's overseen by a woman by the name of Luz Maria Frias. And whenever we represent a state agency, board, or commission, which is we have over 100 of them, the lawyers who represent those agencies report to her. Then we have our, uh, our public safety group, which, would, which this funding request would fall into. But in addition to trial, criminal trials, like, like what we'll use this money for, we also do all implied consents. As you know, if anybody gets a DUI in the state of Minnesota, there's also a parallel process of their license revocation happening. We represent the state in those matters. And that's a pretty big group of about 25 people who run all over the state doing DUI work. And we also have in that group all the work we do on uh, expungement, pardons, and a whole range of other things that involve criminal uh, matters. And then we have our consumer division. And in that division, we have the work we do on antitrust, consumer fraud, uh, wage theft. Um, we have charities in that group, and we have 
our consumer action group. <clears throat> now our consumer action group is, is important to, to every legislator in the state of Minnesota because you will get constituents who are gonna call you and say, Senator, I got a really big problem. You can have them call us and if it's a consumer fraud issue, we will help them untangle the problem. We had 52,000 calls last year, and uh, we resolved these matters and put about uh, 14, no, yeah, $14 million back in the pockets of Minnesotans through resolving. This allows us to escape litigation. So a lot of times, say, you know, some company, company, ABC company, will promise to do something, didn't do it, consumers complains, can't get anywhere, calls us, we call the company, and the company says, okay, yeah, we'll refund that back, or we'll give that money, we'll, and that happens quite a lot. And then our consumer group is the one, you know, we, we were in the news just last night because there was a, a, we, there was a fellow who was going around saying that I'll do your in-ground pool, and people were coughing up 30 grand, and he would abscond with the money. So we sued that guy, we got a default judgment, it was just last night, so we do that. So that's sort of the whole, deal right there. Um, you know, all the opioid litigation, that's our consumer group that does that. Uh, we recently resolved a case of 235 million and then last year we did 296 million and we're resolving these cases all the time. We're pursuing uh, action against three insulin manufacturers. I know you all passed a wonderful piece of legislation to help people who are in emergencies with insulin. Well, we believe these people are engaged in unlawful competitive practices and we're suing them for it, uh, but it's all pursuant to statute. This particular appropriation we're asking you for is in a small part of our group that had been stripped down. For your information, Senator, when Skip Humphrey left the office, the state appropriation to the Attorney General's office is nominally the same as it is today, nominally. If you account for 2% inflation per year, we're talking about a 30% cut in about 20 years. So what had to go? Something. But at the end of the day, it was victims who were suffering. And so I'm here asking you all for money to make sure that people, people get justice. There was a police officer who uh, responded to a call where somebody let off 80 shots in Albert Lee with one of these switches, you know, these guns you can get a tool to make it shoot a lot like that. And the officer got hit. But for that officer's protective vest, we might have lost that man. But we prosecuted that defendant for first degree attempted murder, convicted him. And now there's a little bit of comfort that that guy at least won't be on the streets to shoot police officers. So this is the kind of work that we're doing. We do it all the time. And, and Senator, if, you, if you'll indulge me just for a moment, you know, we got cases in Carleton County, Roseau County, Dodge County, Becker County, Pennington County. Clearwater County, I got a sheet right here. I'd love to, if anybody wants to see it for themselves, I'm happy to share it. Thank you, sir. Senator Draham. Thank you, Chair, and, and thank you for that info. It, it, I, I'm genuinely interested in, in how it's set up, and, and uh, uh, I, I didn't realize that you had 340 employees. That's quite a bit. Um, so the the budget for the labor portion of your um, appropriation is approximately how, how much? Mr. Chairman, so <clears throat> you're about, about what we're here today or on labor? Just, I, I'm tr trying to get an idea of percentage wise, hiring um, nine new, you know, seven new attorneys and, and two legal assistants you know, how does that compare to the other 340 employees, 150 attorneys, and 190 <coughs> staff members? Just kind of back of my mind, just seeing if it's appropriate. Yeah, and uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, well, what it will do is put us in a position to say yes to the counties that call us. It will be a significant increase, Senator. There's no doubt about that. But it, but it's a number that we have identified based on conversations with county attorneys, based on history, based on the number of calls that we get. And I, here's, a, here's, here's, here's a whole bunch of calls that, you know, I, I, these aren't new. How many are right? How many number are right here? I think there's 44. So there's about 44 cases right here that we've done in murder cases. 
Senator, for the folks who practice law on the call, you know that that's an eight-week ordeal. I mean, you're in court, you're in court all, every day, almost all day, and there's a lot of preparation, and there's just voluminous amounts of documents to go through. You have to prepare all of your witnesses. You have to review. It's, it's involved. And, and I would like the senator to know that it's not just criminal that these lawyers will be doing. And this is important to tell you. They'll also be doing one other thing that you should know about, and that is <clears throat> sexually dangerous predators, the involuntary commitments process, which I'm sure you're aware, with, aware of. Those lawyers will do those, but that's all they will be doing. When you put together the involuntary commitments with sexually dangerous predators and the criminal cases, these people will be all busy the second they're hired. Senator Graham. Thank you. Um, you know, just kind of penciling in, um, so at this appropriation, and, and I support the whole concept, what, what uh, the Senator Murphy has brought forward. Um, I know the counties need more help. I've heard from counties in my district. They appreciate your office. Um, so I, I, I don't disagree there's a need. I just want to make sure if we're in the Finance Committee, we're doing the numbers, if you will. Um, so if you subtract a couple hundred thousand off for um, the non-attorney staff, um, so you got 1.8 and divide that by seven, you got about 257,000 per employee. Is that kind of uh, a normal, what the other 150 attorney pay scale is about? Mr. Chairman. Go ahead. So, what I'm, so here we have my, my staff, I want to say thank you for getting it. So it would be about 245 per attorney, 154 per legal assistant, okay. so which that includes not just salary, but also benefits and overhead. So for example, um, if you can pay somebody $100,000, but, but, but that's not what that person costs to the state, uh, as you well know. And so, yeah, that, it's about 245 per attorney, 154 per paralegal. And I would just like to, this is a chance for me to just tell everybody that the paralegals are indispensable. They catalog, organize, files, engage with victims, families, and they're, 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 they're very much part of the ask. Senator Friends. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Murphy. Thank you, Attorney General Ellison. Um, Senator Draheim and I represent uh, parts of Blue Earth County, and the Blue Earth County attorney has made it clear that it's not just the capacity that this bill would be helping with, but the expertise. Um, you know, out where we are, Senator Eichhorn, Senator Dames, um, the county attorney's offices are smaller. And they have less sophistication in some of the areas of murder, violence, crime. And so uh, I, I would be a yes vote on this bill, not just because it will increase the capacity. And I think the public does want us to support prosecution. I think um, if you talk to your average Minnesotan, they're going to say, these are the types of defendants we want to make sure we have the very best prosecution for. But I think there's a, um, you know, for the lawyers on the panel, everybody loves lawyers. Um, it's the experience of doing it over and over again. You know, it's kind of like the implied consent rotation. Like you have lawyers who do this all the time, they tend to be able to put out a greater level of skill at the prosecution. So for both those reasons, um, and uh, Senator Draham, I heard from the Nicollet County attorney too, please support this request. And so I'll be a yes vote. And I want to thank you, Senator Murphy, for bringing it forward. And thank you, Attorney General Ellison, as always. Thank you, Mr. Chair. M Mr. Thank Chair, you. Thank, thank you for pointing that out. And I would like to just echo what Senator Friends and Senator Murphy said. Our county attorneys are good lawyers. They absolutely are. But if you have two lawyers in your office and you have to have somebody who's advising the county board, you have some condemnations for some property issue, you have an easement issue you have to do, you have a whole, you're already pretty busy. Somebody's got to do the fifth degree control substance cases. Somebody's got to do, you know, the, the, those important everyday felonies where there might not be, they, we might not deem them as serious. But then if you have a county where there's a murder, like in Todd County, there was somebody who killed both of his parents and absconded to Mexico. There's all kind of blood spatter. There's all kind of, there's DNA evidence. There's all complicated 
uh, financial information. There's, inter there, I mean, there, there, there's a lot of stuff. And so because our folks only deal with these kind of cases, we've built up some expertise and we're in a position to be helpful. And under Minnesota statute 8.06, and the Minnesota statute 8.06 passed by the legislature, it says that the county attorneys must ask us to come in. I have no authority, Senator, not even a little bit, to walk into a county and say, that's going to be my case now. Uh, if I tried to do that, the judge would say, you have no jurisdiction, your case is dismissed. So I can't do it. Uh, my ability to be effective and helpful is based on a good relationship with the counties, and we have one, we're proud to say. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, 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 Senator Murphy, maybe you can clarify this for me. I'm, I'm looking at the language of the bill, and it says enhanced criminal enforcement and related initiatives. And I'm curious, it doesn't seem to be what we're talking about here today in support of county's attorneys. Can you help me understand what you're envisioning within this, within this uh, language? It seems extremely broad. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senator Pratt. Uh, and this is specifically for enhanced criminal prosecution, and the Attorney General just described the relationship uh, about how those cases come to the Attorney General's office only through the county attorneys. Uh, and so the language is very direct. This is funding for enhanced criminal prosecution. It's simple, it's clear. Uh, and this is a funding request for this important office and for this function for our process state of Minnesota. Do you have anything you want to add, General Ellison? Thank you, sir. Mr. Chair, so we're operating through Minnesota Statute point, uh, .801, which says the counties ask us what they want us to do, and then we respond to those requests. So, we, so it's not broad because it's limited by what county attorneys ask us to do based on the statute. Uh, and uh, it doesn't confine, I mean, Senator, it doesn't, re it does not restrict the county from asking us to do a lower level offense. The question would be whether based on just staffing we could do it. We did do a misdemeanor level environmental case for Clearwater County. It involved complicated hydrology and a whole bunch of science that I don't understand. but with our criminal group and our environmental group, they all understood it and they, we got a good settlement and we were able to leave the people of Clearwater County uh, in a better position with cleaner water, cleaner air. And, uh, and so, but that was not a murder case. You know, that was a, another kind of case. So, I mean, it, the statute does not restrict the counties for what they want to ask us to do. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Senator Murphy and Attorney General. Well, I'm not asking about the statute. I'm asking about the, the language in the bill, which seems extremely broad and, and doesn't seem to focus the, the, the funds that are being requested specifically to those activities. So, Mr. Chair, I'd like to offer the A4 amendment. Senator Pratt offers the A4 amendment. Mr. Chair, while Senator Murphy is getting the amendment, let me just do a quick explanation of what <clears throat> the intent here is. Uh, when Senator Murphy first dropped the bill, uh, she included some very important uh, restrictions on use of the funds. And I would point you to the amendment. Uh, I'm going to use the bigger one here, right? Uh, I'm going to use the amendment uh, on line, starting at lines uh, 1.6. Uh, this appropriation shall be used to hire 10 full-time equivalent attorneys and two full-time equivalent legal assistants to specifically enable the Attorney General's office to aid the enforcement of criminal laws of the state 
to respond to the unmet needs of counties and to provide necessary assistance with the county prosecution of serious offenses. Um, that's what the discussion here has been, uh, but that's not what the language in the bill says. And so, you know, as even as I asked the question about how broad the language was, we continued to focus specifically on the on the uh, tasks that are being requested in this amendment. And so, Mr. Chair, I, I, uh, I respectfully offer the A4 amendment so that uh, we here in the uh, in the Finance Committee and, and the legislature can assure that we're meeting the needs that are being addressed by the author uh, as the key objective of this bill. Senator Pratt, just a question for you. I mean, I, I notice you're not putting in the appropriation for the current fiscal year, but also just the math. We were told it was 254000 per attorney. You're saying they have to hire 10 and um, also some full-time legal equivalents. The math doesn't seem to add up. I'm just curious how you came up with that number. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I believe it was in the Judiciary Committee, and maybe Senator Eichhorn can can establish that the, the number was changed from 8 to 10. It, Mr. Chair, it was in the Judiciary Committee, and I don't remember the number off the top of my head, but the amendment I'm seeing here uh, mirrors what I believe was kind of the, some of the original language that was seen in state gov, and I believe a similar amendment was offered in judiciary as well. Senator Murphy. Mr. Chair and members, thank you, Senator Pratt, for the amendment. And uh, we did have uh, perhaps a similar amendment that was defeated in the Judiciary Committee, um, where there was discussion about uh, this specific language. Um, I, 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 to be honest, don't recall if they talked about the numbers of attorneys in that amendment or specifically what those were. But the request uh, before you in the funding for this fiscal year and the next two in the next fiscal year, so for 23 and then 24 and 25 is to meet an identified need in the Attorney General's office for this purpose. And we know this. Uh, we know that when we draft legislation, that it is being drafted in the context of statute, right? So that's why I keep referring back to the relationship and the current law uh, that guides the work between our county attorneys and the Attorney General's office. Um, that is why it's important for us to say that this is for the purposes of enhanced criminal prosecution, but within the context of the work that is already happening and the law that's currently in place. So as I have seen this language, uh, I think that it is unnecessary. Um, I think that it is, as Senator Marty has pointed out, I'm not sure that the math works. It is missing the appropriation for this year. Um, and it, I... I, I don't want to go back to the, the campaign cycle, but in the course of the campaign, uh, the issue of funding criminal prosecution in the Attorney General's office was a hotly contested issue, and both candidates agreed that this was something that we needed to do, both candidates. Um, the, county, the, the candidate running as a Republican for Attorney General did an op-ed, I have the language, where he said this was a key objective for him. General Ellison said the same thing. We have to fund this office. That's our job here in this, in this legislature, is to fulfill that request. I think that Minnesotans, as Senator Frentz has pointed out, expect us to do this work. It is a part of our justice system, our county attorneys, and you have a letter from, county, uh, from uh, Robert Small, the executive director, who talks about why this is so important. Um, I think the language in the bill is crystal clear. It is for that purpose. Uh, General Ellison has reported to us uh, in other testimony that there is a report that comes back to the legislature uh, every year. It's in statute, so we can track and there is accountability about the ways in which these funds are being used. But this language uh, is, is not necessary, uh, and the language in the bill is clear, it is direct, and that is why uh, it is before us in this committee with this appropriation, and I'd ask the committee to vote uh, down the A4 amendment and to support uh, this proposal to make sure that we have adequate funding in the Attorney General's office to support our 87 county attorneys and Minnesotans across the state of Minnesota who are seeking justice. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you, Senator Murphy, for that answer. Um, 
you know, a couple of thoughts to that. You're right. I think we, uh, public safety was an extremely important part of the campaign cycle. And, and I don't know that we're necessarily debating whether or not we should be supporting our, our county attorneys. The fact of the matter is, is that that's not what your bill says. And there's no reference to the statute that would put those limitations within your bill. It just simply says, and it doesn't even talk about criminal prosecution. You talk about enhanced criminal enforcement and related initiatives. Now, your, your bill was amended prior to the letters from, or I'm sorry, after we got the letters from the, from the county attorneys. Uh, your bill was amended on, on January 19th, I believe. And the letters that we have dated are January 9th and January 12th, which were written to the, to the original language. Sarah Murphy, I'd be happy to change the number from 10 to 8 if, you know, the Attorney General's uh, representative in the, in the Judiciary or, or State Gov Committee uh, made an error uh, in the number he said. I'm more interested in making sure that we have, if we're going to appropriate this extra money, um, which I have concerns about how this, the process is being done, and, and I'll address that in a minute, um, then we should have expectations as the legislature that we're telling the Attorney General, we are doing this specifically for uh, meeting those unmet needs that the Attorney General and you have laid out. And I thought your, your original language did a very good job of doing that. Um, we can have a separate discussion around the monies for this fiscal year. I'm more interested in making sure that we get the language clarified here to make sure that we have the necessary controls and constraints around the use of these funds and that the Attorney General clearly is directed to use them in these fashions. Um, I just find criminal enforcement and related initiatives to be way too broad. It basically says we're giving the Attorney General a blanket check for his entire office, not specifically for the needs that you've laid out. And since there's no reference to statute, there's no expectation here in the Finance Committee or the Senate that they would have to follow any of those rules that, that you mentioned. So, Mr. Chairman, I, I respectfully ask this Finance Committee to take a step back and say we need to have the bill meet the objectives and the needs that are being purported by the author and the Attorney General. Um, um, Senator Champion was next. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Murphy and Attorney General Ellison for being with us today. Um, I am asking to speak because I think it's important for us to uh, understand that the A4 Amendment should not be adopted. With all due respect to my good friend, Senator Pratt, let's be really clear. The first thing I think that we have to be clear about, as it still relates to the A4 Amendment, is that the AG's office or the Attorney General's office is the state's law firm. They represent the state. They make sure that the best interest of the state is their paramount focus. And sometimes they do that through representing uh, age, state agencies. Sometimes they just go out and make sure that they do what's best for consumers. That's the AG's office. What this amendment does, it attempts to uh, reframe what is needed by the Attorney General's office and to meet the need and the philosophical position of some of our members. Here's what I mean by that. It is not unusual for an amendment to be- Mr. Chair, this is so, not about a philosophical uh, uh, discussion about whether or not it's a Republican or Democrat. This is, uh, an this is a legitimate amendment bringing the, the language back to the original bill, and I, I take, uh, I take uh, offense at, at uh, uh, Senator Champion's insinuation that this is political. I'm uh, not, I'm not, Senator Pratt, I'm not sure he was saying it, but continue, I never, Senator Champion. Uh, 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 Mr. Mr. Chair, he specifically I, I, said to meet the, to meet the needs of, or the objectives of, of a political 
position, I, and that's not in, at all what this is intended to be, and he shouldn't be in, inferring our intentions. Um, uh, Senator Pratt, I never said political at all. That is what you inferred. I never said political, not one time. So I, I think if you're uncomfortable with what I'm saying, you and I can have a conversation about that because I never said political because I wouldn't do that. But let me be very clear with you, is that it's the practice, and I think that this is inappropriate even when I think in terms of this amendment is because the very amendment was already put forth in another committee. That committee uh, 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 um, uh, rejected this, this, this amendment. Now, I, I recognize that you have doctored it up in order to make sure that it, 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 it becomes appropriate because of the fiscal no numbers and you change those things. But when you start saying exactly what's, what the work should be of the Attorney General's office when that is reserved for another committee, then that's when I believe that it is no longer wi within the lane of the Finance Committee. Because here's what you have put in your in A4 Amendment, you said needed legal services to prosecute violent crimes and crimes that financially harm consumers and businesses. That's what you said. Th that's not the role of this committee. This committee is to talk about the finances. Are we going to give the finances or not? Not the limitation by which those finances can be used. So that's what I mean when I say the philosophical notions as to how people view this. So if you believe that the, fi the fiscal number is wrong because we don't think that they should have 8, 10, 7, wh whatever the uh, number is, and you want to limit it to that in order for them to do the work that they so eloquently articulated why that, that work would be important, that's okay. But let me say another thing. The Attorney General's office has, has been, what I can understand, talking to prosecutor, prosecutors, county attorneys across the state, looking at what they need that sometimes is tied directly to just straight up criminal prosecution or some, some ancillary things that, uh, that, that, that they believe that they need support and help with. That is what we ask the Attorney General's office to do, to be responsive to our, our county attorneys across the state and to give them what they need or support what they already have in place. So whether it's referencing the statute or not, whether it says, whether it should be uh, uh, Minnesota statute section eight, whatever, we already know where the Attorney General's office gets its power and gets its work. So um, uh, from my vantage point, I would ask you all as members and Senator Pratt, if you feel like I said something to impugn your integrity, I would hope that you would accept my apology because it's never to impugn your integrity. I am speaking directly to what you put on a sheet of paper and how you mischaracterized what I said because you said I said uh, political and I never said it. So the A4 Amendment, I would ask the body to oppose the A4 Amendment and I will re uh, re request a roll call. Thank you. Further discussion on A4 Amendment. Senator Eichhorn, did you have your hand up? Uh, I'll wait until after this okay. amendment. Mr. Chair. Yeah. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And Senator Champion, you're right. You said philosophical, and I'll, and I'll, I, I misspoke there. Uh, the role of the Finance Committee is not just about the numbers on the sheets. The role of the Finance Committee is the last stop before a bill goes to the floor. And it certainly has been the custom and usage of this committee, and as in your other role, you, you certainly understand custom and usage. Uh, over the last two years that I've been on this committee, we've gone well beyond the numbers in drafting bills. But let me just take another, uh, if, we're, if we're wondering about whether or not this fits within the lane, it is certainly within the purview of the Finance Committee to put the controls necessary on monies being expended. That is the role of this committee. We do it in every budget, we do it in every, in every finance bill, in every fiscal note. We talk about how these monies are going to be spent. And so to change, or to, not to change, but to 
uh, refine how these monies should be spent and give additional direction to the Attorney General is wholly within the purview of this committee. And again, Senator Champion, this, this language fully comports to what the author and the Attorney General said that the need is. This was the original language put forward by the author. So I am not misspeaking or misconstruing anything. I'm just simply saying that we should be putting the right controls in place so that the bill that is being presented, or the way the bill is being presented, matches the language of the bill going to the floor. And we can come to an agreement that we want to support our county attorneys. Before the bill was amended, we had county attorneys supporting it. And I just simply think that we ought to put the right direction, give the attorney, the attorney general the right direction to say, this is what, the, this is what you said you needed, this is what, how the, the legislature intends it to be done. And not to try to infer that section 8.01 or 8.06 is automatically presumed when it's not even referenced in the bill. Senator Pratt, I just had a question. You keep referring to the fact that the county attorney's letters were dated at the beginning of the session. The bill has been amended. Are you hearing from some of the county attorneys they don't support this? Mr. Chair, I, I, I believe in one of the committees um, they, they testified that uh, they had supported the bill in its original form, but they had not had a chance to look at it. Mr. Uh, Chair. Post in Senator the Murphy. Judiciary Committee earlier this week, uh, the Executive Director for the County Attorneys Association testified in support of this bill in its current form. Senator Champion was next. Yes, th uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And again, uh, Senator Pratt, let's just, I'm just going to give you my sense of, of things with all due respect. I think that we are um, uh, pressing the notion of custom and uses. Yes, it's true. In, in, in this committee, when we look at numbers, we say what number is appropriate, what number is not appropriate based on the information that we are hearing. But we do not try to do the work of committees. We do not try to do the work of the Judiciary Committee to say what, what words should be limited, what your work should be, and should it be restrained to only X. We try to stay away from that because now we're doing some other committee's work. And Senator Pratt, I'd like to remind you, based on what I've heard, unless someone tells me something different, the language that you have here was already presented. And it was presented in the uh, committee, from my understanding, that would have jurisdiction over this issue, which is judiciary. And they rejected it. So I think it's probably not the, not the course that I would have gone in order to say, okay, since they rejected it in judiciary, I'm now going to bring it again in finance, and I'm going to use a couple uh, of fiscal notions in order to still try to get to the place of space where I want to get to. I just don't think that is how the Finance Committee historically has used its time. Last thing that I'll say. We do amendments all the time in other committees in order to clean up things. So just simply to say, uh, uh, were, were you making me aware of something oh, there, Senator? No. Okay. <laughs> that my time is up? Is that what you're trying <laughs> to tell me? <laughs> right. <laughs> we make, uh, we, we put forth amendments all the time to clean up original language because sometimes someone says, hey, that language isn't right. We don't want that particular language that particular way. And that's appropriate. And then there's the appropriate committee in which to do that work. What would be inappropriate is for Senator Murphy to bring new language to us that was not debated in, in the appropriate committee and then for us to address it here in finance because ordinarily we don't even let people testify in finance. They don't usually testify in finance and you know that and I know that. So there's a reason for that. It's because we don't want to get into a policy discussion that, that, that should be reserved for another committee. So Senator Pratt, Colleagues, I don't want to make this about my good friend, Senator Pratt, who I have a great affection for. I just happen to disagree with him when it comes to this amendment. Vote no on the A4 amendment. 
Further discussion on A4 amendment? If not, the secretary, the staff will take the roll. Senator Marty? No. Senator Friends? No. Senator Pratt? Yes. Senator Champion? No. Senator Dames? Senator Dreheim? Yes. Senator Eichhorn? Aye. Senator Mohammed? No. Senator Murphy? No. Senator Pappas? No. Senator Westrom? Yes. Senator Wickland? By a vote of four to six, the amendment does not prevail. Is there further discussion of the bill? Senator Eichhorn. Thank you, Mr. Chair uh, and Senator Murphy. Uh, one thing I have, I am going to have an amendment here. I'm just going to make one comment and then I'll offer it. Uh, so when we heard this in judiciary, it was mentioned that your office, Mr. Ellison, didn't track some of the requests for assistance from counties. Um, and we think that having this information could definitely be helpful to the public and the legislature. So with that in mind, I have the A5 amendment. And Mr. Chair, if you want me to talk about the A5 while it's passed out, I can certainly do so. It's being passed out. You can go ahead and explain it while it's being passed out. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So the A5 uh, amendment simply says that the Attorney General must report annually by January 15th to the legislature and the committees having jurisdiction over uh, state government and criminal law on requests for assistance made by county attorneys under the section. And the report must include detail on requests by the counties, uh, the criminal activity involved in the case, and for which assistance was requested, and whether or not the Attorney General's office uh, was able to provide the requested assistance to the county. We think this is kind of a good governance thing. Uh, it just gives us a chance to, to know what the requests are, know what the data is. We don't know if, if two million a year is the right amount, or if the right amount is four million a year, or if it's one million a year. More data is always good for the public and the legislature. It uh, adds sunlight to what we're doing. Um, we see this in other areas of government, especially in the Environment Committee, where we have several reports and um, you know data on things, and it helps us derive our decisions. So we think this is kind of a good governance thing. We hope it's uh, something you'll see as a friendly amendment, and it would help us as we go forward make decisions on whether or not this funding is correct in the future. Maybe it's less, maybe it's more, but it help, will help us make decisions in the future. So that's the realm and why I offer this today, Mr. Chair and Senator Murphy. Senator Murphy on the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senator Ort Eichhorn. I, I am one of the things I am learning about the Minnesota Senate is uh, the process of amending is like live theater. So I am reading through the language uh, to make sure that I understand what it is that you have before us before I respond. And I appreciate uh, your explanation. And yes, this was a question uh, that came before us uh, in the Judiciary Committee. Uh, General Ellison has already shared with us uh, that he uh, and the office has an obligation to share a report back under statute uh, about all of the work that that office does. There is a reporting mechanism, an accountability mechanism. Uh, I do not know uh, the processes of the Attorney General's office uh, and how this works with them, but I will say in general, when I think about my, my tenure in the legislature and the issues that we bring forward that we construe as useful information. Uh, often one person's useful information is another person's unfunded mandate. Um, we, we make the case to ourselves and to people um, that if we get this report, if we ask for this information, if we ask the people who work in a state agency or in another constitutional office to keep track of how many calls that they make and give us a report that we will have a better understanding of whether or not that office is doing the work that we need it to do. And I, I appreciate that that is a number that some people, that's something that they look for. I, I don't, from my perspective, believe that this is a measure 
of accountability because it doesn't tell me anything about an outcome. It doesn't tell me um, that indeed the Attorney General's office was funded in such a way that it could respond to and actually take up the cases necessary. All it tells me is how many calls that they got um, and then uh, what happened. It doesn't talk about an outcome. And in pursuit of, especially around spending in government, we often ask agencies, departments, nonprofits, et cetera, to generate these reports for us. Um, but I don't know that they actually, in the end, do much good. They create work, but not much good. And I am a deep believer that our work together as policymakers has got to be about the improvement of Minnesotans' lives, and in this case, about justice. And while I, I recognize you're offering this in good faith, I don't think it gets us to that objective at all. And so I would ask that the committee not support the A5 amendment. Senator Pappas, Kerry Heim, <coughs> Champion, or I didn't know if you had <coughs> Senator, Senator Pappas. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I've been reading over the language and thinking about uh, all the years I've been in the legislature. And, you know, I think we, we feel like we're providing some level of accountability when we ask for these reports. But the reality is we all have busy lives and these reports sel seldom get read. They end up on a shelf. I think that, um, that you could easily verbally ask or write a letter to the Attorney General and say, hey, would you mind giving me an update on these criminal um, prosecutions and what's going on with county attorneys? Um, I just really think this is really important, the work you're doing for county attorneys. I'd just like to know how it's going. And I think it can be as informal as that. And I do feel that our public officials are accommodating when the legislature asks or staff asks for information. So um, I think this is unnecessary language. I think it would slow it down. My understanding, the other, the other body doesn't have it. Um, and I think it's important that we get these dollars to the Attorney General's office um, as soon as possible. So I would oppose the amendment. Senator Eichhorn, I couldn't tell if your hand was up, but I'm told it was. I can go ahead. Okay, Senator Dreheim, then Senator Champion, then Senator Eichhorn. Thank you, Chair. Uh, and uh, Senator Murphy, uh, thanks for the comments. And, you know, I, I think we all view our roles here a little bit through the lens of our life experiences and how we were trained in our careers. And, you know, as, as a business guy, um, you know, I, I use information every day. To make decisions mainly on budgets and resources and um, it's my understanding that in another committee when they asked about how many calls if you will or requests from counties the attorney general's office got they didn't have an answer and when I look at 340 employees 150 attorneys and there's only 2% of them that work in the field that your bill, my understanding, was designed to help with, which I think we all agree there's a need. And when there's a need, you got to spend money. Um, you know, if this amendment was adopted, it would help me understand, are we giving enough resources to the Attorney General? Or maybe we need to give more resources to the counties. So they can hire more, more attorneys because I know they are, they're struggling. There's, there's no question about that. Um, but I, I'm a transparency kind of guy. I've done a lot of bills on transparency. I have an amendment coming that will that'll go to that too. But I, I don't think it's unrealistic to just keep track of the requests from counties. I, I don't think that's a lot of work. I don't think that would entitle FTE to do that. Um, and, and I, I don't think it's unrealistic for the people of, of Minnesota that fund uh, the good office um, to expect a little bit of transparency if that office is meeting the needs of the people. Thank you. Senator Champion, then Senator Eichhorn on the A5. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chair. Briefly, it is my understanding and, uh, that this particular amendment was already, already previously debated in the uh, uh, previous 
Mr. Chair, Senator Champion, not to my knowledge, that this amendment was not offered in judiciary. Okay, got it. Um, I'm asking the committee to vote no on A5 amendment. I, I believe that it's well-founded and, and comes from a, a rich place. Um, but I believe that it increased costs. This gets to an unfunded mandate. We often talk about individuals should not be uh, required to do work that we have not given money for. Um, uh, and we also believe that individuals should be able to do the work uh, that they were commissioned to do and not spend so much time doing reports, especially if we're going to put them on our shelf and do nothing with them. We hear this often with teachers. Uh, when we think in terms of, 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 of reports and, and all the other testing that they have to do and all the time that they have to spend um, doing those things as opposed to teaching our kids, right? And so I want the Attorney General's office to be prepared and ready and capable and resourced in order to uh, adhere to the requests of our county attorneys across our wonderful state. And last but certainly not least, this report will only talk about what uh, the report that is being requested that I'm asking us to oppose at this particular time would only look at things from the attorney general's perspective. Counties have the, their perspective of their county folks and they can respond to what their counties need. But obviously the counties are not meeting the needs because if they have to call on the attorney general's office, not just for um, bodies, but also support and capacity and all the other things that we do as lawyers to interact and work with each other in order to make sure that we can prosecute or deal with a, a, uh, a specific legal matter. So I'm asking the body to oppose the A5 amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and you know, Mr. Chair, I hope we don't get into a, uh, a, a debate here about whether or not amendments were offered in other committees or not. The custom and usage, again, of this committee has been, you know, very broad. And in fact, I remember Senator Champion, while I was presenting uh, a bill here last year that had gone through Jobs Committee, reintroduced an amendment that had been dis discussed in the Jobs Committee. And so, you know, I, I, I don't want to keep having this argument going back and forth, but my question is actually for the Attorney General. Uh, and that would be how many how many times did uh, county attorneys reach out to you, and how many times were you unable to meet those needs, uh, Mr. Chair? So I have a list of the cases that we did since I was the attorney general. I haven't counted them. I think they're forty four, but I'd like Mr. Mr. Chairman and, and Senator, the attorney general's office is at every single meeting that the Minnesota Counties so Attorneys Association goes to. They know us. What happens when they have a case? is they will call David Voigt, who's the head of our criminal division. David Voigt will then say, well, we can take it. We can take it in six months. Or we'll say, well, look, we just, we just don't, we can't have the, we don't have the capacity now. And then what they will do is they will figure out how to manage that. Maybe we'll call another county in. It's, it's just not useful information. And it doesn't really tell you much because you know, it does because it's not like they submit a form and then we stamp it yes or no. It's a it's a discussion that we have between people who know each other very well. So this amendment would add a lot of work, but it really wouldn't reveal very much at all. And I that's the answer to the question. Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well and and I hope I'm not, you know, misstating your answer, but this is how I interpreted it. Um, we've been talking about this unmet need that we need $2 million in order to fill it. Uh, we've, you've helped out with 44, 45 cases, but you can't tell me how many you've had to say no to. You can't tell me how many total have come in. And that's exactly what this bill is getting to is, is what is the capacity that is truly needed to meet the unmet need? We still have not defined what that unmet need is. And that's what the report is hopefully intended to uh, provide this legislature going forward. So as you come back with additional requests, we have the information necessary. I'm, I'm a little un uncomfortable when I hear the I don't know or, or we can't say this is how many unmet needs we had. Might be, it, I understand it takes staff time to coordinate maybe with other counties to get those to get those additional supports that are needed. 
that certainly, you know, that's certainly work that uh, your folks are engaged in, certainly work that would be under the stated objective of this bill. And I think it ought to be counted, and I think it ought to be discussed. Mr. Chair? The Attorney General's office has existed for 157 years. We've never needed this kind of reported requirement before. It, what you'd have to get to the information that you would like to know, you'd have to literally survey all county attorneys and say, would you have sent the case if the help was available, and then get that number. And then that might tell you what it seems that you would like to know. But the fact is, we have a custom of usage in our, of our own, and we have we, we discuss these things and come to a conclusion as to what we can take and what we can't. We have had to take, uh, but we have had to say no, or we have had to say we can't do it now, and then they've gone and asked another county to help. But this, uh, I just think that it's uh, red tape and uh, doesn't help anything. Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, just to correct you, Mr. Attorney General, we're not asking you to go out and survey all the county attorneys. We're just asking you to include detail on the requests that you do receive by county. So that's all. Thank you. Senator Eichhorn, finally on A5 amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I know it's been discussed a lot, so I'll try to keep it short and just say, you know, I think transparency in government, no matter where it is, is good. This just adds another layer of transparency. I'm sad to hear that some folks just take these reports and put them on a shelf. But when I get these reports, like Senator Dreheim, I'm here till 7, 8, 9 at night. I look at these reports, and it helps frame decision-making regardless of the subject area. So I think more data is always important. Transparency is good. I would ask that members vote yes on this. It's a good transparency vote. I think we should have it. And Mr. Chair, I'd like to request a roll call on the vote, please. The staff will take a roll on the A5 amendment. Senator Marty? No. Senator Friends? No. Senator Pratt? Yes. Senator Champion? Senator Dames? Senator Dreheim? Yes. Senator Eichhorn? Aye. Senator Mohammed? No. Senator Murphy? No. Senator Pappas? No. Senator Westrom? Yes. Senator Wickland? On a four ayes and five nays, the motion does not prevail. Further discussion on the bill? Senator Dreheim. Thank you, Chair. Um, I have the A6 amendment. On the A6 amendment, it will be distributed while it's being distributed. If you can um, go ahead and start explaining it. Thank you, Chair. I'll, I'll make it brief. Uh, it it kind of um, it's along the same lines as the last amendment, and uh, asked the uh, legislative auditor to do an audit on this new spending, so we can get a a, a better picture of what kind of cases um, this these resources will be used, and uh, report back to us next year to see if we need to increase funding. Um, and, and, and it's been, if it worked or not, that's it. Senator Murphy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, uh, Senator Dreheim. I'm going to ask the committee to oppose this amendment as well. Uh, I've already mentioned, as, as General Ellison, that there is a statutory report uh, every year that uh, is available to us. Uh, I think that is where we're going to find our data, plus the interaction, plus the outcome. Uh, so I, I don't think that we need to ask the legislative auditor to do a review of this constitutional officer's uh, work. Uh, I do want to uh, call our attention to the letter from Executive Director Small. And there are two salient points. One in the first paragraph, the Attorney General's office has helped our greater Minnesota County attorneys in homicide cases, but due to the lack of criminal division staff has not been able to accept requests for assistance in other cases involving violent crime, white collar crime, financial exploitation, federal habeas corpus petitions, and multi-county prosecutions of drug or human trafficking. The budget request will address the issue of capacity and inadequate criminal division resources for the Attorney General to adequately respond to county attorney requests in these difficult cases. And then the last sentence. 
in the rare instance of a serious crime occurring in these greater Minnesota counties, it is often beyond the experience and resources of these small offices to properly prosecute a case. A group of experienced prosecutors from the Attorney General's office to respond to a request for assistance is in the best interests of public safety. It is not often that I believe it is important to read to a committee the content of a letter before them. This request is about Minnesotans and justice and going forward. Will the Attorney General's office be properly funded to do the work that the county attorneys are asking them to do? Executive Director Small is calling to our attention that the office is not properly funded. We're asking for funding. I understand the skepticism. I've had some sidebar conversation uh, with some of our Republican colleagues about the skepticism of this request. But I think we need to pay attention to our county attorney offices. Mr. Small lays out the argument for this. I don't believe that we need to have a legis legislative auditor report because there's already a report in statute. That is the accountability. And with that, I'm going to ask you to vote no on this amendment respectfully. Senator Westrom, then <laughs> Senator Friends, and Senator Drahan. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, Attorney General Ellison. Um, you talked about uh, the the guidance, and I think it was you referenced MinStat 801 um, as the guiding uh, principle of what county attorneys can request uh, for assistance. Um, and that kind of drives or puts the parameters on what your attorney general's office is doing. Uh, this would ask just for a report back to us, so I think that's very reasonable. But Attorney General Ellison, under your current budget, uh, you do have some discretionary dollars and ability to put more effort into this uh, uh, area as well if nothing passed. Isn't that correct also? Mr. Chair, uh, Senator, no. I have, uh, when I got to the Attorney General's office, there was one full-time trial prosecutor I uh, shuffled the money around and got it up to three. Um, the, we, we have gone to some other uh, uh, lawyers in the office who have historically had some criminal experience and they have taken a case here or there, but they don't do it every day. And so at this time, uh, because of all of the statutory obligations that actually uh, imposed on us by the legislature through statute. We can't meet all the needs that we have and increase our criminal trial team. We need your help. Senator Westrom, if you would follow up. Uh, Mr. Chair, um, Senator Ellison, uh, did, I, did I hear your testimony Senator earlier Ellison. correct? And was it Minnesota Stat 801? And, and is that what you're uh, is, the, is, the, is it that statute that this money will all be tied to? And, and if so, uh, why, why don't we at least add that reference to this bill? And maybe that's a little bit for the author as well. But for, for, for your perspective, I would, uh, I guess, ask, uh, it seems like that's, that's the direction and that's the authority, county attorneys, and, and the, the ability for you to uh, meet those needs when they're requested, uh, but we don't reference it in this bill. Uh, wouldn't that just be a, uh, a good uh, reference as we're, as we're tuning this up, up for final passage? Mr. Chair, Senator Westrom, I think it would be unnecessary duplication. We cannot take a case unless the counties send it to us. Uh, and so you're right in that uh, Minnesota Statute 8.01 does determine whether or not we take a case at the trial court level or not, or, or for that matter, a um, involuntary commitment case involving a sexually dangerous predator. Uh, but it's all based on the county's initiative, and we can't get a case but through their request, except for I will say the governor can appoint us. That's true, and I don't want to be misunderstood. But 99% of the, I've only had one case where I've talked to the governor about a case. Mm -hmm. Every other case, all 44 of these cases in this document are through county requests. So um, I would say that it would be a, a, a necessary duplication. And I 
Thank you for your question. Senator Friends. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Senator Dreheim, I serve on the Legislative Audit Commission, and I'm going to ask members to vote no on the A6, but assure you that we do have a robust process for determining which audits we do each year. As you know, legislators get to put in their requests and priorities, and I'd be happy to work with you on this one um, if that's helpful. Thank you, and thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Senator Dreheim. Thank you, Chair, and, and uh, great discussion. Um, you know, I, I think the general public would uh, be surprised with the number of attorneys working on what we're trying to expand here, existing. You know, we got 150 attorneys covering four divisions, um, but if there's only three working in, in that uh, criminal uh, defense area, um, you know, I, I think the public perceives it as more, and I, and I think that's a transparency issue. Um, and I don't think there's anything in statute, and, and Senator Murphy, you can correct me if I'm wrong, uh, that mandates the Attorney General to have X amount of attorneys in each one of these divisions. So I think asking some, for some reporting on $4 million is not, uh, not out of line. I, I thought Senator Eichhorn's uh, proposal was reasonable, and, and I think this is also reasonable, and I support, support it still, and I urge everybody to vote yes on the A6. Mr. Chair, roll call. Senator Pratt asked for roll call. Uh, the staff will take the roll on the A6 amendment. Senator Marty? No. Senator Friends? No. Senator Pratt? Yes. Senator Champion? Senator Dames? Senator Dreheim? Yes. Senator Eichhorn? Aye. Senator Mohammed? No. Senator Murphy? No. Senator Pappas? No. Senator Westrom? Senator Wickland? Yes. There being four no four yeses and five noes, the motion does not prevail. On the bill, Senator Murphy. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members, for a robust debate. I'd urge your support for this piece of legislation. Mr. Chair. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a, a process question on this bill, uh, which may lead to another amendment. Um, we are, in, in Section B of the bill, we are appropriating money in, in fiscal year 24-25 and ongoing. Um, we have not established, and we already have a base budget for the Attorney General. Um, we have not set targets yet um, I'm curious how in your how are you viewing this additional appropriation as it pertains to the rest of the budgeting cycle and and moving forward is this now a new part of the base that we are approving without budget targets um, Senator Pratt we as you say we have not done the budget targets that's a long process ahead yet um, I happen to think that the this request is one that's an ongoing need and expect it's likely to be part of an ongoing budget, but none of those discussions have not gone further at this point. Did you have some? Oh. Uh, Mr. Chair, you know, we, we have the governor's budget. We have the, uh, the budgeting process going forward. It seems more appropriate to me that that uh, anything looking out into the future would, could be increased as part of the, you know, it could be added to the budget targets. It could be, uh, you know, after the February forecast, especially since these monies won't be appropriated until after the new fiscal year. Um, Senator Pratt, I believe the first appropriation is in this fiscal year. Mr. Mr. Chair, I would then request an oral amendment to strike lines 110 through 112. Senator Pratt moves to strike lines 110 through 112. Is there a discussion of that amendment? Mr. Chair. Senator Pratt. Uh, several members on this committee have talked about the need to get these monies into the Attorney General hands immediately. Sections, you know, lines 110 through 112, section B of this bill, doesn't kick into effect until the next fiscal year. And we've not done the appropriate budgeting process to add that into the tails going forward. 
it seems appropriate to me that that should be part of the budgeting process, not done by this, this committee or any other committee on the fly. So we can provide the Attorney General the immediate relief that's being requested and still follow past practice and uh, proven practice for ongoing budgeting and having a robust discussion about spending in the upcoming biennium and beyond. Senator Pratt, you're correct. We could do that. I think we've had an hour and a half of good discussion on this, this appropriation. I think the I happen to think the county attorneys are right that we should do this. So I, I oppose the amendment, but um, but yes, you're, you're right. We could deal with that later in the budget process as well. Mr. Nauman, may I ask Mr. Nauman a question? Mr. Chair. Go ahead. Thank you. Mr. Nauman, um, this is effectively bypassing the budgetary process. And would this have the effect of increasing the base and affecting the forecast that's already being uh, put together? And maybe, you know, enlighten the committee on any other impacts this, this change might have. Mr. Nauman. So, Mr. Chair and Senator Pratt, I think you bring up an interesting sort of how to think about this question. Um, in the forecast, the Attorney General's office has a $52.4 million base for fiscal years 24 and 25. The total office, when you consider other funds, is at 93.9. .9. There's mostly other special revenue fund resources. So given the testimony, I think the assumption is that it's base plus these amounts. But as you point out, the appropriations for 24 and 25 have yet to be made. Um, I think it's an interesting question, and I would want to visit with MMB about what they would infer from this when they come when it when it's time for preparing the next forecast. Will they look at this simply as this is the appropriation for the agency, and they would then forecast it at that level. I think that's probably nonsensical. So they probably would not do that. And they'd use some budget rules to say that the budget rules from the fiscal 23 appropriation would then be pushed forward, and this would be added. However, the language probably leaves that as a little bit of an open question. But I think MMB would have the space to make that interpretation. Senator Pratt. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, you know, I think we might be able to get bipartisan support to say that we, we want to support the county attorneys, despite my uh, being uncomfortable with how broad the language is. Uh, I think 269000 to meet an immediate need and going through the proper procedure uh, on allocating budgets for the next biennium is, is a more appropriate way to do it. Uh, and so what we're talking about as far as, as the 24-25 appropriation are not immediate monies. Those won't have an impact on the Attorney General's office now, but section, the first section will. And I'm willing to take that risk and, and continue to have this discussion uh, going forward. But I am very disturbed at the process and the precedent that we seem to be establishing. And so... Mr. Chair, I request uh, a roll call vote on the uh, on the oral amendment. And 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 members, I, I I mean this sincerely. Let's let's get a bipartisan vote on this bill. Let's help our county attorneys. Let's help uh, prosecute these crimes. And let's go through the process that we've been going through for 160 years. I I, I hope is um, I know that when Senator Murphy is putting together her budget bill in the next coming months, she's going to be very aware that this has just been adopted, if it has been. But but yes, this is a on the amendments. Um, Senator Murphy, did you have any comments on it or not? Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chair and members, and thank you, Senator Pratt, for the amendment. I want to let you know that we have had a bipartisan vote on this bill already in the Judiciary Committee. That's good news. Um, there is bipartisan support for this. Uh, I think about this from a very practical level, and I understand and appreciate uh, your concern. Uh, it would not be a precedent to do this. Of course, the legislature has appropriated money early in the legislature to meet an urgent need, and that's what this is about. 
But imagine this, if you would, if you are the attorney general or the person responsible for hiring a specialized attorney who can do criminal defense and the job is five months long. Imagine uh, your ability to actually fulfill that need without the ongoing uh, commitment of funding uh, for a position that goes forward. That's why it's important that we think about the, the funding for this, this fiscal year to complete this year and the ongoing funding so that we can actually the Attorney General can actually build and, and restore the funding for that division uh, that is the purpose of this legislation. And so if we were only to do uh, the funding for fiscal year 23 as you're describing your amendment, uh, we would essentially be sending the signal that we're not really serious about this, that we would be happy to hire a temporary person to fill that role and perhaps we'll come back to it in the budget. I don't think that serves the urgent need that we're hearing from the County Attorney's Office across the state and I don't think it meets the needs of justice so I would ask the members to vote no on this amendment. Senator Westrom then let's vote. Mr. Chair, um, Senator Murphy, uh, in your bill right now what what is the strong assurance uh, we have as a legislature that this money will be used for uh, helping the county attorneys and not be uh, through discretion or other uh, efforts used for something else. Uh, uh, let's say the, the, the need drops in half in five years for some reason. Uh, what, what is going to be our guarantee that this money is still used for the county attorneys or uh, the legislature uh, is informed or, or the information comes back to the legislature and says, uh, we don't have as big a demand as we used to have. Uh, can you point us to language that's, that, that makes this uh, solidified, that, that it's going for what, what is being represented to the, to the committee today and to the legislature? Thank Senator you, Mr. Murphy. Chair, uh, and thank you, Senator Westrom. Uh, I believe this question has been asked and answered um, in the current law in 8.01. There is a relationship between the county attorneys and the attorney general's office with regard to how these cases go forward. Um, the attorney general has testified in every committee uh, to that question, um, and he's testified here in this committee to that question. Uh, and I believe, as I just said, that the question has been asked and answered. Mr. Chair. Senator Wester. Mr. Chair, uh, Senator Murphy. Uh, I think it probably needs more belts and suspenders. Uh, I don't really find an answer in your answer uh, other than uh, hope that everything that's been talked about is remembered and reviewed by the Attorney General in two years and four years and maybe the next Attorney General, if Attorney General Ellison uh, isn't, uh, doesn't run and isn't reelected in four more years, the next Attorney General isn't going to be reviewing these tapes uh, as uh, at the forefront to figure out if there's anything that restricts them from deciding to shift this money away. And I think those would be some valid uh, points that the legislature should, should uh, key in on. And uh, uh, through, the, through the budget process, uh, I think we could do that. So I think the Pratt Amendment, let's get the, the initial money out the door. I think there's more examination to make sure this money doesn't get discretionarily used for something else, even though it's being um, used or intended right now for uh, the assistance of criminal prosecution with county attorneys and the, the assistance to the county attorney's office. But uh, I don't feel the, 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 that there's strong safeguards in place to make sure that that's what this money goes to or, and that's where it stays. On the Pratt oral amendment, there's a rule call. The staff will take the rule. Delete section, paragraph B, lines 110 through 112. Senator Marty? No. Senator Friends? No. Senator Pratt? Yes. Senator Champion? Senator Dames? Senator Dreheim? Yes. Senator Eichhorn? Aye. Senator Mohammed? No. Senator Murphy? No. Senator Pappas? No. Senator Westrom? Yes. Senator Wicklund? By a vote of four ayes and five nays, motion does not prevail. On the bill, Senator Murphy. Thank you for the robust discussion, and I urge your support of this important legislation. 
Is there further discussion? If not, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? No. Motion prevails. Thank you, Thank Attorney you. General Ellison and Senator Murphy, and we're up with Senator Dibble's House File 26. And the seat is warm. Welcome to the Finance Committee, Senator Dibble, House File 26. And were you working off the language in the bill? I can't I have the bill number in front of me. Mr. Chair, we did make a modest amendment in our and committee, so I think we would work with uh, the, the Senate language in the House bill. Right. Or, it's I don't know House if File 26, but the language in, that's contained in Senate File 24. Correct. Um, so thank I mean, you, Mr. Chair. Do you Chair. need any kind of amendment for that at no, all? No. When the bill comes over, my understanding, Senate Council, correct me if I'm wrong, that the, the bill is the automatic substitution Senate language stays, the House file comes over. He has to make a motion if he wants to take the House language instead. Okay. All right. Thank you. Senator Dibble. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and members. Um, Mr. Chair, members, the Federal Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, the IIJA, um, as everyone is no doubt well aware, uh, was signed into law in November of the year before last. Uh, and of course, it provides for a historic level of infrastructure investments over five years coming to the state of Minnesota, both through increases in formula funds as well as the opportunity for applying for discretionary competitive grant programs. Uh, most of the IJA is focused on uh, transportation, um, but there's also a number of other elements. This bill doesn't really deal with those. Um, water infrastructure, broadband, uh, environmental matters, energy projects, Senator Friends, uh, and the like. Um, I think it's estimated that Minnesota stands to receive something on the order of $7.4 billion over the next five years. Uh, three quarters of that or so would, would be for transportation purposes. What this bill would propose, Mr. Chair and members, is to allow MnDOT the authority to spend uh, $315.5 million of federal money uh, from the Trunk Highway Fund in fiscal year 2023. These funds are available via the IIJA, but they need the authority to spend those dollars. Um, specifically, uh, what MnDOT has done to date has been, I think, doing some jiggering and shifting around, and so this would actually restore uh, existing trunk highway bonds, uh, as well as an additional $80 million to fully fund the approved fiscal year uh, construction plan. Um, the amendment that was offered in committee uh, would limit the administrative uh, expenditure of these funds to uh, no more than 17%, which MnDOT tells me um, is fine. Uh, it was offered by the Republican lead, uh, Senator Chazinski, and I accepted that amendment as friendly. I have uh, Mr. Josh Knatterud Hubinger here, who is the CFO for the Department of Transportation. Were you planning to provide your own independent testimony or simply respond to questions? Happy to answer any questions. All right. He's my, um, he's my phone a friend, Mr. Chair. And I apologize, but I'm told by Senate Council that Rule 45, which automatically keeps the Senate language, does not apply in committee. So Senator Dibble would, well, Senator um, Pappas would move to Restore the Senate language, the language in Senate File 24, in the into House File 26. On that motion, that's thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senate. That's what I was wondering oh. if you needed that motion. Yes, we do need that motion. Yeah. So Senator Pappas makes that motion. Is there a discussion on that? If not, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed. Motion prevails. Discussion uh, on the bill, Senator Pappas and Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Senator Dibble and your witness from MnDOT. I didn't catch your name. Uh, Mr. Chair and members, for the record, Josh Knatter-Hubinger, CFO at MnDOT. 
Can Kna- you say that again? Kanatarud. Kanatarud Hubinger. KH also works. I think I'm going to say KH. And I'm usually pretty good with names. <laughs> um, and and you're, maybe I could call you by your title. CFO at MnDOT. CFO. All right, Mr. CFO <laughs> and Senator Dibble. Um, so you mentioned, Senator Dibble, in your comments that um, MnDOT was able to uh, move some money around. I mean, the big concern last year was that if we didn't pass the match uh, for the IIJA funds that we would lose out, especially with some of the competitive grants. So uh, were you able to, to, Mr. CFO, were you able to keep up with those grants? Um, were the things that you think you lost out on? Um, can you just give us a little update? Mr. Chair and members, uh, so in fiscal federal fiscal year 22, uh, we were able to deliver all of the formula federal funds. We didn't lose any formula funds. We were also quite successful both in 22 and 23 on receiving discretionary grants. So part of the challenge as a state is when you receive discretionary grants, there's a match need that goes with it. And every month and year we wait to get this authority, it just puts us further and further behind on those types of things. So within that 315, about 30 million of that is to be used for the match on some discretionary grant awards we've already received mm -hmm. for uh, some bridges in Austin and a project in Bemidji. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just a short follow-up. Um, I know uh, we're handling the matching funds for the Public Facilities Authority, and they, because they didn't get their matching funds, they basically couldn't do any projects. They couldn't move forward. So they didn't have any kind of funds like you did that they could move around. And so, I mean, there really are consequences when we don't do our job up here. So I would strongly support getting this legislation moving early. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. Chair and, and Mr. Knetterud. I hope I pronounced that right. Um, just a quick question. So I'm used to seeing smaller administrative amounts, and, and I appreciate you working with Senator Jasinski on, on this amount. Uh, can you help me understand what's included within the administrative cost and doesn't include some of the engineering that's specific to MnDOT versus what other agencies might have? Mr. Chair, Senator Pratt. So uh, in general, the appropriation that is being increased, our state road construction appropriation, is about a billion dollars, and our typical appropriation language allows us to use some of that for specific administrative costs and engineering to go with it, which includes both internal staff and consultants. And right now on that in entire pie, we spend about 12% of that pie on largely engineering to engineer the projects and oversee them. And so when we get new pots of money, especially bonding, that 17% is our standard boilerplate language. We typically do not get anywhere near that 17%. But that is a historical amount we've gotten over the last, say, 10 years for bond appropriations. Mr. Chair, just, just it does include the a lot of the engineering costs that would be specific to MnDOT versus other agencies. Mr. Chair, Senator Pratt, of that 12%, I said about 10% of that is engineering. Further discussion on the bill? If not, Senator Muhammad moves that Senate file 20, uh, House file 26 as amended be recommended to pass. On that motion, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion prevails. There being, uh, Thank you, Mr. There being Chair, no members. further business Mr. of the committee, Mr. Thank Chair. you, Senator Dibble, Mr. Kanadarud, Hubinger. Thank Senator you. Be Brett. Before we adjourn. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for indulging me. Uh, well, thank you, Mr. Chair, for a robust discussion today. Uh, two questions. Um, you know, we have a, we have a bill, uh, Senate File 2, uh, paid family medical leave, which is uh, going through the legislature. Uh, and uh, while we are waiting for a fiscal note, um, it's also come to my uh, attention that there are concerns about local impact. And so, Mr. Chair, under uh, statute 3.987, I would, I would ask you to join me in requesting a local impact note and having that available before the bill is heard in finance uh, so that we could potentially, uh, and, and help me uh, uh, direct the uh, LBO to do that uh, work. Sure. Um, Mr. Chair, that seems reasonable to me. Senator, um, Mr. Newman. Ms. Mr. Chair and Senator Pratt, um, just a little clarification. I think this is the first time I've been asked 
in the committee about the process for requesting a local impact note. Uh, the chair of the finance committee, the ranking member of the finance committee, of which you are, um, may request a local impact note. Um, the same members on the tax committee may also request a local impact note. By custom and practice, a letter is typically drafted and submitted to the Legislative Budget Office, and then they begin their process. Thank you. I'm asking Senator Marty to join me in that letter and, and a commitment that we would have that information available before being heard in finance. Um, Senator Pratt, that seems reasonable, and I, I'd be glad to do so. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And then just one other question. Uh, any thoughts on our schedule for next week? Not yet. We don't know. We're still waiting to see what's coming our way yet. And I think a lot of that's uncertain yet, and I don't, I haven't, don't know where the bills are that might be getting here next week. Uh, no further discussion. This meeting is adjourned.